And I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to that last book of your Bibles, the book of Revelation. And we're looking this morning at the last of the seven letters to the seven churches. We'll look this morning at the Jesus letter to the church at Laodicea. I want you to imagine this morning hiking in our desert on a hot day. Maybe going up to the top of the Superstition Mountains and back down. As you approach the parking lot where your car awaits and, and there is that hydro flask, you know, the one with the ice water, it's been waiting for your arrival. Can you imagine opening the car door, having the sun having been beaten down on your head, your throat is parched, you open the car door, you open the flask, and you begin to down its contents, and you realize that was the wrong flask. This bottle contained last week's milk, and it's warm and sour and curdled. It's not a pleasant thought. Switch gears a moment. Imagine a very cold day, and you're trudging through the snow. It takes a little bit more imagination in Arizona in June. You know, the kind of cold where the wind bites through layers of clothing. I don't know if you've experienced the kind of cold where everything is covered up but, say, your eyeballs and your brain hurts because the cold is getting in through there. Winters in Chicago were like this. The wind would take that cold right through all the layers into the bones, and you would ache for cold. Imagine you're in that kind of cold, and, and there is a log cabin with a wood fire and a mug of hot chocolate. And you get to the cabin door, you burst inside. You are ready to warm yourself up from the inside with that mug of hot chocolate, and you begin to down its contents, and you're already wondering, what's in the cup? I couldn't think of anything. So there the illustration ends. Janet said, try formaldehyde, so we'll go with that. <laughs> And expecting hot chocolate that would warm the bones from the inside, you take a big swig of formaldehyde. <laughs> what is the result of curdled milk on a hot day or formaldehyde when you're expecting hot chocolate? You would spew the contents out of your mouth. You would vomit. And what kind of a sermon illustration is this? That's not pleasant at all. We're going to turn our attention this morning to a church that was so unpleasant to Jesus' palate that he said, I will spit you out of my mouth. It's very unpleasant. What, what kind of a church would Jesus say this about? We're going to turn our attention to the first century, to Asia Minor, to that Roman province that is now called Turkey. And we're going to look at a real church, a real church that existed, received apostolic instruction, and then received the darkest, most awful audit of the seven that we find in Revelation 2 and 3. This is the bleakest of them all, this last letter to the churches. Look down at your Bibles and read with me Jesus' words to the church at Laodicea. Revelation 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. To those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous 
and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We'll look this morning at six elements of Jesus' evaluation of the church at Laodicea. It follows a similar pattern to the other letters we've seen with a couple of differences. It begins, as the others, with a salutation, the greeting. Uh, Like most letters open, from so-and-so to so-and-so, this is a dear Laodicea from Jesus. And notice verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. Again, what would it be like for Jesus to write a personal letter to Grace Bible Church or to any church or to you personally and give a rundown on what is going well and what is going not so well spiritually? Laodicea had this gracious privilege. Laodicea was a wealthy city. It sat in the corner of several trade routes. We'll have one more map, the last in the series here, and you can see where Laodicea sits. It is the seventh in the circular road of those seven major cities in this area, each one of them having a church that Jesus wrote a personal message to. John, again, was on the island of Patmos off the coast, writing to this area, an area where he had been in ministry for decades. Laodicea was wealthy. Laodicea, because it was on a crossroads of trade routes going in four directions, became a banking center. Uh, People would come in and make deposits and withdrawals. They had a large stash of gold as deposits in the bank. And so the city became wealthy through its banking. It was also the home of a unique and fashionable clothing industry. Uh, The sheep that were bred in and around Laodicea grew deep, plush, soft, jet black wool. And Laodicea marketing campaign did a good job of convincing the fashion world that black wool was in. And so they sort of had a market on that. They had a corner on that market. They became wealthy through that clothing industry. And Laodicea also had a medical school that specialized in ophthalmology. It was begun in the third century BC. That's a school that specialized in treating eyes and helping vision problems. Laodicea also had the benefit of getting a letter from the Apostle Paul. The book of Colossians is a letter from Paul to the city of Colossae, to the church that was there. And in Colossians chapter four, Verse 13, we read this, I testify that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. So Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis are three major cities in the same valley. And so Colossae and uh, Laodicea were neighbor cities. And then in verse 15 of Colossians 4, Paul writes, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea And then down at verse 16, it says, when this letter, the letter to Colossians, is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So Paul wrote a letter to Laodicea, that might be the book of Philemon, that was also to be read at Colossae, and Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians that was to be read in Laodicea. So there was a heritage here of apostolic instruction. That was 61 A.D., by the time of John the Apostle getting the revelation from Jesus Christ and this letter to Laodicea, it is now AD 95. So some 34 years later, what is the condition of this church? This letter, of course, comes from Jesus and in each of the letters, Jesus introduces himself in a unique way. Here in verse 14, Jesus calls himself the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The word amen is simply an affirmation of truth. We say it at the ends of prayers. Uh, Maybe it feels to you a little bit formulaic. It it means something like truth or true that or so let it be. May it be so. 
It is an affirmation that what has just been declared is the truth. And here, Jesus Christ is called the Amen. He is the embodiment of truth. This probably is a reference to the wording of Isaiah 65, 16, which in the Greek translation of that Old Testament text uses the same wording as is in the Greek text here in this letter. But there in Isaiah 65, God is said to be the truth. So an interesting ascription of Jesus' deity here, when those things ascribed to God properly in the Old Testament are ascribed to God the Son here. He is true, the the truth embodied. He is truth itself. And then Jesus says he is the faithful and the true witness. It means that he is faithful in his own character. What he says goes. He doesn't go back on his promises. He doesn't alter his character. He is true through and through. He's true in his word, true in his character, and he is the true witness. In other words, Jesus' testimony about the condition of the churches is accurate. Jesus isn't concocting things here. He's not cooking the books. He's not exaggerating. There is nothing hyperbolic here. Jesus is a faithful and true witness. His assessment of the churches is trustworthy. His opinion of the church is what counts. Doesn't matter what the culture says, doesn't matter what the leadership of a given church says, doesn't matter what the people think about themselves, Jesus' assessment is what counts. And then he describes himself as the beginning of the creation of God. Uh, English is funny here. It might kind of sound like Jesus was the first one created. That's not the import of these words at all. Jesus here is the origin of the, or the source of all that is created. And what's interesting that this letter to the Laodiceans is a parallel or a, even an addendum to the letter to the Colossians. Again, the letter to the Colossians, you, you probably could call it Paul's letter to the Colossians and to Laodicea. And here's sort of a second installment letter to that church. And it picks up on some of the Christological themes that are there in Colossians. You may remember in Colossians 1.15, Jesus Christ is called the preeminent one over all creation. Like the, the firstborn son in a royal household he, is, household, he is the one that is given all the rights and privileges as rightful heir to all that belongs to the family. Jesus the Christ, the second person in the Trinity, very God of very God, God the Son has all the rights and privileges to the universe. He is the preeminent one over all creation. And Colossians goes on to say that from him and through him and to him are all things, speaking of Christ, which sounds a lot like Romans eleven thirty six: to God and from God and through God are all things. Such grand statements about a personage could only be made about God himself. So here you just have one more affirmation that the one with whom John is dealing and the one who assesses the churches and the one who is everywhere present and aware of every thought of the human heart is none other than God himself. The person of Jesus Christ is Lord of the church and he cares about his church. Thinking about Jesus as the origin and source of everything that's created is really important for the spiritual condition of the church at Laodicea. And spoiler alert, we'll get into this just a little bit more detail in a few moments. But the problem at Laodicea was their proud independence. They thought they had everything they needed by their own resources. They had been lulled into a situation where they thought, we don't need Jesus, we got this. And they would tip their hat, they would give lip service to some fidelity of Christ in an organizational matter, but truly they were pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps, believing that what they could muster up for themselves made them okay with God. And nothing could be farther from the truth. A reminder from Jesus that he is the beginning or the source or the origin of everything that is created is a reminder, even in this introduction, that Laodicean so-called Christians, you need Christ. You don't have what it takes. 
You don't have what it takes to merit favor with God. You don't have what it takes to live out a spiritual life. You don't have what it takes in your own resources to do anything that matters, anything that has lasting value. So even in the introduction, this is a a reminder from Christ's very person at how utterly dependent all of us are all the time on God. Think about this, God spoke everything into existence at the beginning of the world. Just spoke it, and it came into existence. And Colossians 1 tells us that Christ upholds everything by the word of his power. Another way to say both of those realities is, if Jesus didn't speak you into existence, nor keep speaking you into sustaining your very existence, you would cease to be. You are fundamentally dependent on him as creator and sustainer. And it will truly be said that from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. To forget that, to live independently, as if I'm going to go about my business and, ah, yeah, Jesus, is to fundamentally misunderstand all of reality. And that was the problem with the church It leads to the confrontation. Here is Jesus' confrontation of the church at Laodicea. He says, verse 15, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. There is no commendation in this letter. And I know at Sardis, the dead church, there was no commendation either, except there was this little asterisk. There are some of you at Sardis who have not soiled your garments. But here at Laodicea, nothing. No footnote. Jesus has nothing good to say about this church. There were none who were alive. What does it mean to be lukewarm spiritually and And why does it sound in this verse like Jesus would would actually prefer you to be cold towards him, indifferent towards him? We need to examine how the Laodiceans would have heard this rebuke. You see, it sounds to us like uh, you can be, number one, on fire for Christ. That's hot for Jesus. Or you could be ice cold toward him. Either of those is better than thinking along with the Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just all right with me, man. Be hot or cold. Hate me or love me. That's better than in between. That is not the message of this letter. Jesus does not wish for you to be cold towards him in terms of a spiritual indifference, in terms of no spiritual life. And we have to sort of put ourselves in Laodicea to understand this. We're going to get some help from understanding the local situation in the first century. We need to understand how a resident of this city would hear Jesus' words. Laodicea sat in a volcanic valley with two other prominent cities. We've mentioned Colossae already, and then Hierapolis was another city in this valley. The water supply in Laodicea was awful. The Lycus River flowed through the center of the valley, and by the time it got anywhere near Laodicea, it was silty, filthy, disease-ridden, and there were no natural springs near the city. If you were to get potable water in Laodicea. It had to come from somewhere else. Their water source was not reliable, and when the river flowed, it was awful. Silty, stinky, bad to the taste, and unhealthy. Hierapolis, which was nearby, was actually famous for its water. It was a natural hot springs. You can imagine a a volcanic thermal valley, something like Yosemite Valley, and you get bubbling hot springs and sulfur pots and and cascading waterfalls of, of sort of petrified minerals that come out of water and springs. Hierapolis had the hot springs, and they had medicinal value. They had benefits for people to be there. Colossae, on the other side, had cool, fresh, clean water. Laodicea had neither. One particular benefactor in the city decided, I'm going to solve this. I got a solution to this. We're going we're to pipe in good water. 
And so at great personal expense, he, he laid a long aqueduct, and it was an aqueduct built out of, out of stone that had been hollowed out and pieced together in long tubes all the way from Hierapolis. You can imagine the cost in the ancient world of building such a thing. And those medicinal waters were good in Hierapolis, but by the time they went through these stone tubes and made it to Laodicea, they were no longer hot, they no longer had any medicinal value. In fact, they were lukewarm, tepid, and made people sick. This was the water they drank every day in the city. This self-styled solution by a self-made man in a self-sufficient city did not solve their fundamental problem. It did not bring life. The water was putrid. So this wealthy, self-sufficient city, far from a life-giving water supply, sought by its own resources to remedy the situation, and the result was bad, very bad. It tasted bad and made people sick. Jesus compared the spiritual condition of the church in that city to the water that its residents drank every day. And Jesus comments about the spiritual state of the city. It makes me want to vomit. The city's water supply was a tangible metaphor for a church that was self-satisfied, self-sufficient, indifferent to its true spiritual state. A church that, along with its culture, thought, we have everything we need. They had lost their sense of dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. If only they had cool water to refresh the weary or medicinal water to heal the sick, the city had neither. If only the church had something like cool water to spiritually bring refreshment or, or, or some message that would bring about healing for the spiritually sick. But no, the church had become like the world, indistinguishable from the surrounding environment and therefore unhelpful. Why would you establish a city with no natural springs? Where the only source of water would dry up some summers, and when it was there, was dirty. That location was not suitable for a growing city, and yet the city grew. Why did Laodicea grow historically? Because there was money to be made. Uh, like the silver rushes in Colorado that have, have left ghost towns, and the gold rush in California and the Yukon, places where you wouldn't build a city, but Tent cities grew up because there was money to be made hand over fist. Laodicea was like that. The people went there to make their way. Look at verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and yet you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The city's water supply was a metaphor for their spiritual condition. The city's economic situation was a metaphor for the church's spiritual condition. They make a claim, I'm rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. The banking center in town had made the bankers wealthy, and the banker's wealth spilled over into the other people in the city. Those raven black sheep and the wool industry that came from it. In fact, some people believed that the, the particular breed of sheep drinking the local bad water had something to do with the velvety jet black wool that was produced. Well, they turned it into a fashion statement and a money-making extravaganza. It became the height of fashion in its day. The city prided itself on its medical school and on ointments that were produced from local minerals as ISAF. All the world came to Laodicea, hoping for help with vision. A medicinal product put Laodicea on the map, so people came. People came and stayed, people came and made their fortunes, people were self-sufficient. So wealthy was the city, in fact, that when a great earthquake hit in 60 AD, and Emperor Nero decided to, for selfish reasons, sort of take the opportunity to rebuild the cities after his own fashion in Asia Minor, and, and all of the cities took empire assistance, Laodicea refused. 
He said, we don't want your help. We got this. We'll rebuild. And rebuild they did. They built a stadium that was three football fields long with oval track on each end and continuous seating all the way around. A giant stadium for races and games. One benefactor for the city built heated covered sidewalks throughout the city. He said, you know what, I'm going to put my name on this place. And what a luxury. Everywhere you went through the city, the, the sidewalks are warm and we're out of the elements. Another piped in oil for heating the bathhouses. Listen, this was ostentatious luxury in the ancient world for the whole city. There was an inscription found at Laodicea on one monument, and it literally says, from ourselves. It's an, and it's an inscription post-60 AD earthquake after the refusal of Nero's help. We did it our way. We built this. That was their motto. The irony of that particular inscription is the, the man who wrote the inscription, designed and had the thing built, died before it was finished. <laughs> And his heir had to complete the project. And something you need to understand from Roman culture, it has to do with social status and patronage and benefactors. The Roman world was was built on honor, an, an exaltation of self, an exaltation of the man. And the honor was passed down generation to generation. And, and whatever honor you could accumulate for yourself was passed down almost like an inheritance to your progeny. And so the best thing you could do was accumulate monuments to your achievements and your titles. And so throughout the Roman world, you go through the Roman world and see all the ancient ruins, you will find statues, obelisks, fountains, buildings, all kinds of architecture that have tributes to the person who contributed. Now, the, the, many of these were not built by the state, by the government, by the empire, but funded by private citizens who wanted their names on plaques. In fact, in Roman culture in this day, you earned money to get money to spend your money to buy honor. That's a little different than us, right? We, we work to get money to have status of having money or to buy pleasure, or recreation, or stuff. But in the Roman world, you worked hard to earn money, to spend all of your money, to have people give you accolades. Oh, the benefactor who put in the oil pipes so we could have heated sidewalks. Let's say his name over and over and over again. And the plaques on these monuments would have the name and all the titles of every position you've ever had. Second runner-up vice president clerk at the Elks Lodge, 1983. You know, all, all of them listed under the name. And these things passed down from family to family. What does Jesus say? About all of this, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I've need of nothing. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What a contrast. Do you ever think about your self-assessment over and against God's view of you? Do you ever have that conversation with yourself? Think I'm doing okay? What would God say? God who sees hearts, God who knows motives, and that works both ways. It's possible to not believe true things about your identity because you're in Christ. Be discouraged because things are out of proportion. But I think more often than not, the natural tendency of the human heart is to think more highly of self. To have an inflated view of self. To think independently. To see ourselves as not being needy, desperate, naturally spiritually bankrupt, that any good thing in me is only from him. (laughs) And I'm a debtor to his grace. And I'm a beggar for his provision. That is a Christian life. That is the Christian life that the church at Laodicea had abandoned. You see, the church was like the city. 
Think back to chapter two and verse nine, Jesus spoke to the suffering church at Smyrna, and he said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, and you may remember that word for poverty is abject destitution. Don't know where my next meal's coming from. And Jesus, in this little parenthetical statement to that church says, but you are rich. The world says you're destitute, but I say you're rich. Jesus' assessment is better. Accurate, faithful, true. And to the church at Laodicea, just the opposite. Yeah, we're rich, we're fine, we got this. And Jesus says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Let's think for a moment about the relationship between the church and the city. Think about what it's like to be a Christian in culture. You see, we, we tend to be like the people we are around. That's true at an individual level, it's true at a corporate level. There are ways, I'm convinced, that Grace Bible Church is like America that are unbiblical. I don't know what they are, we need to change them, we need to root them out, sort them out, find them and repent. It's just hard to describe water to a fish, isn't it? We swim in the culture that we're in, we don't know any different, and and it takes a long time to have the mind renewed by the Word of God such that we become actually, positively, in biblical ways, countercultural. Sometimes we need to have our eyes open to things we're not ready to see. There was something about the ethos of the city of Laodicea that was attractive to the professing Christians in the church at Laodicea. The church became like the world it was in. It was like there was something in the water. There's a relationship between church and culture, and we think about Romans 12 too, do not be squeezed into the mold of the world. That is a wise prohibition from the Lord, knowing our tendencies. Uh, Let me give you a a couple of motivations to be like the world, and just at the front end, if, if we think that the church should be like the culture in order to be relevant, I'm gonna tell you you are going to be absolutely, eternally, and in all other ways, irrelevant. The pursuit of relevance makes you immediately irrelevant, partly because churches chase culture and they're behind anyway. You think you're gonna be cool enough for the world to like you, that's a trap, it never works. The world just laughs at the church and its cheap imitations of worldliness. Destroys the church, never wins an audience. But the reality is, if you seek relevance with the world, you're thinking about the relationship totally backwards. The church has what the world can't touch. Just embrace it. Embrace the foolishness and the power of it. It is the wisdom of God, though it looks like the weakness of the world. So a few motivations to be like the world around us. One is um, sometimes we're motivated by misguided evangelistic zeal. I wanna have a message that people will listen to, so I gotta be like the world so they'll hear the gospel. That's a big heart, and it's wrong-headed, misguided. A second motivation we could be trapped by is a motivation for comfort. That is, we, we just don't wanna be noticed. I don't wanna stick out like a sore thumb. It, it's hard to be a Christian. You see what happened to those Christians at Smyrna? Have you seen, have you heard about Philadelphia? Boy, they get hunted down, they get run out of their jobs. That's a lot to ask. I I just want a little bit of Jesus. (laughs) I don't gotta get radical. So motivated by comfort, uh, blending in. I don't wanna be made fun of, or worse, outright persecution. A third motivation might just be apathy. That is, you're not really motivated by anything. You just go with the flow. It's natural, you're not even thinking about your relationship to the culture around you. You just wake up each day and you do what everybody else is doing. Consider Psalm one. In fact, let's turn there together. In 
this charge to be intentionally countercultural is not new to the New Testament. This first psalm gives us the same charge. How blessed, happy, is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Verse 4, the wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And if you're in agriculture, you understand chaff. The kernel of wheat has to be removed from the useless, flaky surrounding that you'd toss the thing up into the air and the wind would blow away the chaff. Or if like 86.3% of the people at Grace Bible Church, you're roasting coffee beans at home somehow, you understand chaff. And, and, And the chaff has to be blown away from the coffee bean so that your coffee tastes good. And the world around the faithful in Psalm 1 is called chaff. Well, let's just plug chaff into this desire to be relevant for a moment, the desire to blend in to culture. God's going to destroy the wicked. They'll be blown away in His judgment. The chaff who will be blown away by God's judgment, we want the chaff to like us, so we're going to be chaff-like. We want the chaff to listen to our message. I'm going to put on my chaff costume for evangelistic advantage. Or, you know what, I'm going to look like chaff so that the chaff won't make my earthly existence uncomfortable. I mean... A comfortable, easy, healthy, prosperous life, isn't that what we all want? I can keep the Jesus stuff tucked away, not offend. Do you remember the church at Ephesus? In Acts 19, they heard the gospel, they believed Jesus, and they followed him at great cost. You remember in the city square, they burned 50,000 days wages worth of magic books. I'm not sure what a day's wage is. I think you can get a job at McDonald's for 18 bucks an hour. If you worked eight hours a day, that works out to $7.2 million worth of magic books burned in the city square at Ephesus. Why? Because the gospel's taking hold. And, and people are saying, I don't want to, we're not like the world anymore. I'm not who I used to be. I'm different. And it was evident. They didn't want to blend in. They were glad to stand out. Do you remember Demetrius the silversmith at Ephesus? His job was to make relics, artifacts, idols, representations of Diana, the goddess of fertility. There is the center at the uh, the city of Ephesus. And, And he got together a riotous mob to say, the Christians are at fault. Great is Diana. Get these people out of here. Why? Because he was losing money. He made his living selling silver trinkets representing Diana. And now people aren't buying the trinkets because they're worshiping Jesus. That is countercultural in a way that is relevant and actually resulted in a transformed city. You don't get there by aiming at relevance, you actually get there by being faithful. Laodicea had a church that looked just like the ethos of the city. The church was not countercultural. The church had fully imbibed the ethos of the city, and to Jesus, the Lord of the church, the Laodicean church tasted like the city's water supply. Vomit inducing. These were churchgoers, not necessarily outwardly hostile to Christ, but apathetic, indifferent to Christ. There is probably no worse situation for a soul than to have everything you think you need in life without actually knowing Christ personally. It's funny, the world chases after all of that stuff. Well, shouldn't it be okay to want to be healthy, wealthy, and wise? 
Is it okay to pursue prosperity and, and long life and good relationships and, and things to go well and the government off my back and some vacations here and there and some recreation thrown in? The church at Laodicea, along with its city, experienced the, what we might call common grace blessings of a high standard of living. Luxurious clothing, thriving businesses, no persecution, monuments to their achievements. And yeah, throw in a little church going. Add a little bit of Jesus to the otherwise self-satisfied life. You know, keep everything in balance. Having all of your earthly needs and desires met, to be satisfied in life without being satisfied in Christ is the most dangerous place to be. This is the real deception of Bible Belt-ism or Christian culture, where sometimes there's not a big difference between what Christianity looks like and what the worldly culture looks like. You can be lulled into a sense of, oh yeah, I'm good with God, I go to church, filled that square, and I go about all the other things of my life. Christian, listen, you know the benefits of trials in your life. You know the benefits of hardship that lifts the Christian heart to God, where you recognize all over again you are absolutely and utterly dependent on Him for everything. Long periods without trials tend to inflate our independence, self-satisfaction, spiritual apathy. It's actually very dangerous to have things go your way all the time when your heart is not fully devoted to the Lord. It's probably more difficult to live as a Christian when things go well than under trial. What if you could have everything right now that you believe would make your life comfortable, satisfying, easy, luxurious, every broken relationship fixed, every monetary need met, Every health concern immediately and permanently relieved. What if you had all of it, but not Christ? Would you take it? What if you were told that to have Christ, these things would be taken away from you? Yeah, you you go ahead and hold on to Christ. But we're gonna take your stuff. You're gonna lose your health. You'll lose relationships. How would you respond? We get to see a story about that this evening if you come back for evening service. Jake is gonna preach through the entire book of Job, which is an answer to that question. Would you be willing to give up everything that makes your life comfortable and convenient and luxurious just so you could still have Christ? These are good heart questions for us. I didn't invent them. I kind of stole them from Jonathan Edwards. They're penetrating. It's a good question to examine yourself. Listen to the prayer from Proverbs chapter 30. Godly man says this, two things I ask of you, Lord, don't refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. And give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion so that I'm not full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Do you hear the heartbeat of that prayer? Lord, give me my daily bread. What you see that I need to just sustain my life. If if I'm comfortable, fat, dumb, and happy, I'll forget you. I know my heart. And and if I'm destitute, would, would I steal and profane your name? It's a great prayer. The church at Laodicea thought of itself as worth a lot. And in Jesus' estimation, it was worse than worthless nauseating. Here's a command beginning in verse 18. Jesus says, I advise you to buy from me 
Gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. White garments so that you may clothe yourself so that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus is saying here, you need to come to me and get what you do not have. You don't have what you most desperately need. Treasures that last. Listen, treasures in heaven belong to Christians. Jesus says you don't have it. You need clothing that will withstand the scrutiny of God's judgment. The finest, most luxurious clothes that come out of your city will not stand the fire. You need white robes, the righteousness of Christ imputed to your account. You need to be clothed in a gift that comes by faith alone. You need what Jesus offers, not what you can produce yourselves. And he says, come to me and get eye salve. You're blind. And you're blind to your own blindness. You do not see that you do not see. Think about what Jesus says here. The city prided itself in its clothing that it produced. The world loved their product. You need clothes you don't have. The city prided itself in its monetary resources. You need gold that will last past the destruction of the universe. And all of this so that the shame that you would face for trusting in your own resources will not be revealed. I think Jesus here is referring to the the fine clothes of the self-made man, maybe self-made religion. And it only leads to shame. This is about church-going people who don't know Christ. They think of themselves as spiritual, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. They assume they're dressed and ready to meet God because they wear the garb of religious activity. They will be exposed. Jesus says, you need eye salve that I provide. They were stone cold blind. The medical school, the pharmaceutical dealers, they didn't have what Jesus alone could provide. Friends, do you understand God's assessment here? Do you have your ears on? Are are you listening to what the Spirit says to the church at Laodicea? You have to come to grips with God's assessment of your condition. If you go on thinking that you're good enough, that you'll figure it out, you'll sort it out by your own resources, you'll come up with a way to provide what would be pleasing to God, what would get you into heaven, what would make your life work out right, what would bring you satisfaction, any of those ultimate questions, friend, you do not have what it takes. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is he offers to you himself. He offers to you all that you need and he offers it to you without cost. This reflects the great invitation that God gave in Isaiah 55. Yo, all who are thirsty, come to me and drink. Come to me and get all that you need for free. Why do you? Spin your wheels, all your resources, all your time, all your money for stuff that cannot satisfy, the prophet Isaiah says. All of this is available as a free gift by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If you were to abandon hope in self, get off of that lifeboat. It's not a lifeboat, it's an anchor. And embrace Jesus Christ and all that he offers in his infinite generosity. You will immediately be clothed and fit for heaven. You will immediately be given infinite treasure that cannot be stolen, rusted, or moth-eaten. And your eyes will be opened. Listen, the gospel is offensive to the self-satisfied, the self-sufficient, the proud, but to those who see their own spiritual bankruptcy, it is the best news ever. Everybody is born spiritually bankrupt. You need eyes to see it. And when you see it and you turn to Christ, (laughs) that you get rescued and you are given everything You look back on that old life and you say, I trusted in me? What folly, what shame. 
What poverty. This is how Paul felt. Listen to Acts 26 as Paul is recounting his own conversion to Christ. Paul was full of himself, educated, self-satisfied, self-righteous, had everything that could be had in his world. He was at the top of his heap. And he was employed actually to be hostile to the brand new baby church following Jesus. Paul says, I was doing this in Jerusalem. I, I locked up many of the Christians in prisons. I received authority from the chief priests. And when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. As I punished them, often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme I was furiously enraged at them. I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, Paul says, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were sojourning with me. And Paul fell to the ground like John fell to the ground at the sight of the glorified Christ. He said, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Interesting side note, when Christians are persecuted, Jesus takes it personally. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you've seen but also to the, the things in which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And then Jesus says to him, I am sending you to open the eyes of the blind. Impossible task. But everyone who has been rescued by the gospel of Jesus Christ has been given this same impossible task. We look back at our former lives and we say, I was blind. Jesus came, opened my eyes, now I see I'm his, I'll give up everything for him. Uh, who else is blind? Let me tell him. That is the Christian life. Look at verse 19, Jesus says, those whom I love I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. This is so gracious. Listen, we, first of all, we just have to take reproof from Jesus. Nobody likes to be told they're doing something wrong. Nobody likes to be rebuked. But rebuke from Jesus equals love, according to verse 19. Correction from Jesus equals love, gracious love, according to verse 19. And think about this. Jesus expresses his love to a church of non-Christians, professing believers who do not have the Spirit and do not have what it takes to get to heaven. It's not the first time Jesus did this. You remember his interaction with the rich young ruler who came to him with the Laodicean disease. Maybe he visited there and drank the water. He said, what rules do I have to keep to go to heaven? Yep, check, 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 did those. I'm good, I got what it takes. Remember Jesus' words. He saw through the verbiage and the religiosity and he called out his idolatry. Very similar to Laodicea. He was a wealthy man. Jesus said, give up all your stuff and follow me. And the man refused. Went away sad because he possessed many things. Here, the infinite treasure, the giver of all things, the beginning and the source of the universe is standing before him, offering him everything, and he says, no thanks, you know, I got a, I've got a Ferrari. Or whatever the top chariot was at the time. And the text tells us Jesus felt a love for him. It's not the first time. Jesus expresses love here to a dead as a doornail church. Just staggering. Be zealous and repent. What a, what a gracious command. You're still alive. Look at verse 20. The grace is compounded here. Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, I will dine with him, and he with me. Look, the other letters 
Commendation, confrontation. Repent or else. There's no or else here. The bleakest letter for the worst church in dire straits with nobody alive in it. And Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And we need to dispense for a moment with the faulty theology that is sometimes garnered from this gracious invitation. Jesus is helpless outside the door of the human heart and he can't do anything to get in by himself because he's so pathetic. That's not the picture here. Jesus has something very important in mind with the church at Laodicea. He is not exalting the, the uh, inviolable fortress of human will. Actually, there was a practice in Laodicea uh, about people who owned property that would not let others in. He, he's taking a poke at, again, some more of their own cultural practices. But the door here is not the door to the human heart. The door is the door to the church. Jesus is on the outs, the church at Laodicea. And he utters this gracious invitation. In fact, this letter is an invitation to all who would hear. Let him who, hears, uh, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to this church. And the invitation is really remarkable. If anyone opens the door, why would somebody in a dead church open the door to Jesus by faith? <laughs> they got born again. And look what Jesus says, I, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. This word for dine is the, the third meal of the day, the last meal of the day. It's not breakfast, dry piece of bread, dry piece of bread dipped in wine. It's not the sack lunch that was taken out for your daily business. This was the sit down meal of fellowship, of warm, intimate friendship. And Jesus says, I will come and I will dine with him. This is Jesus saying, I will come to that individual and fellowship with him. What a gracious, gracious promise. The soft hearted listener ready to recognize his own spiritual bankruptcy would be an open door for Christ back into the church at Laodicea. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize their own spiritual bankruptcy, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not the kind you could produce by yourself, but an alien righteousness that God grants by faith. They will be satisfied. The promise to overcomers or believers is that you would be granted to sit with Jesus on his throne even as he overcame and sits with his father on his throne. Jesus is king, he will reign on the earth and those who believe in him will indeed inherit, will reign with him, will be with him forever. That's the treasure. Nothing on this earth is worth holding on to to miss Jesus. Having Jesus is worth dispensing with everything else, no matter what the culture says. No matter how churches in our day slide along with the culture to destruction. It's worth being countercultural. It's worth clinging to Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need you. And those words are trite and small compared with the reality we need you far more than we know, far more than we could measure. And it's so easy to go about our day independent, careless, thoughtless. And yet, we have nothing good apart from what you provide. Everything good in us is you. Lord Jesus, would you help us to be a faithful witness in this culture, to be willing to stand out, to be different, because we have you. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.